biblical answers to what's taking place. There's always a biblical answer to what's taking place in our world. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? God is never left out of words to be able to speak to any situation. And if we search the scripture, we'll find the answer to these issues that are, we're dealing with. I can promise you that I have spent as much time or more in the preparation for this message here tonight than any message that I've done in Prophecy Files. And yet, it is almost like a plate of spaghetti. It is much complicated uh, and very, very deep. But the fact is, is that we're dealing with it on a daily basis. So I'm going to share with you some things this evening concerning understanding the terms and understanding the times in which we're living. And the Bible says, like the children of Issachar, that when we have understanding of times, we will know, or they knew, what Israel was supposed to do. When we have understanding of the times, then we will know how to respond. And I want you to know something. There's only one way to respond as a Christian. It's not your personal opinion, your personal agenda, but it is a biblical answer to the problems that we're faced with today. And I'm going to give you those answers here tonight, and you're going to be able to take those home with you. I know that we have prayed, but... I, I truly believe that this service, by the time it's over with, could be an earth-shaking kind of surface that literally is going to reverberate throughout the United States because the answer is about to come. And with that in mind, I want you to just pray with me before I begin. And as you do, I know that you've asked the Lord to open your understanding, but I'm going to ask you to uh, ask the Lord to just touch me so that I can bring this to you in the way that it needs to be done. Father, I thank you right now for the goodness of God and your blessings and mercy. I recognize tonight that I am nothing but a vessel. And Lord, your people that have gathered here and those that are watching online, uh, Lord, desire more of your truth and understanding. That's the reason why they're here. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to now open up our understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let every life be transformed and changed by the power of your grace. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody believes it, say a good amen. 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 We're living in perilous times. You're quite aware of that. Second Timothy, the Bible tells us perilous times, fearful times. He goes through a litany of things that describe what that time is going to be like. Men shall be lovers of themselves, boasters, proud, blaspheming. Uh, full of pride, unthankful, unholy, and he goes through that entire list. There's not one of the things that's happening on that list that's not happening right now. And the Bible describes that as the spirit of the age. If you're writing some things down, or if not, you might want to make note of what the Bible has to say in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1 through 3. You can make these references, but the Bible says that we are made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked, watch this, according to the course of this world. Every age, every time period uh, has its own thoughts, its own ideas, its own agenda, its own values for that matter. And it influences the culture. It is identified in Scripture as the spirit of the age. And in that atmosphere of a fallen world, there is the tendency for people to listen and get involved in in the spirit of the age, and it literally lulled them to sleep, causing them to accept the values that may be uh, put on display or the ones that are currently people are involved in. But God calls us to a higher calling. God does not tell us that we're to Uh, conform to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're to live and walk as Christians in a different mindset, not the values or the culture that we're living in, but to be counterculture for that matter, to be salt and to be light. So the believers at, at Ephesus, before they encountered Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2, that they walked according to the course of this world. With all of the peer pressure and the literal satanic-inspired system 
that is now coming to the forefront. It's no longer hiding itself. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. It is no longer hiding itself or cloaking itself. It is, it is evil on, on stage right out front. And Jesus intends for us to live in this world, but not to be of this world, the Bible says. And so because of that, we're to be the ones who are influencing this world more than the world influencing us. And yet, there have been things that have happened in just this past year with COVID and the, and the first time in the history, perhaps, uh, of modern culture for the shutdown of the church and things that have happened that have influenced everybody across the society that has changed the thinking, the mindset of so many. We thought that 9-11 was the change. But nobody had on their radar, there was no prophets talking about it, there was no one that was preaching about it, to say that there would come a time when there would be a catastrophic pandemic, a sickness, a disease that would come that would affect the entirety of the world so much that it would shut down everything that you've known as common. The Bible tells us instead of us being able to walk according to the course of this world or according to the spirit of the age, that we are to be light, we're to be walking in the spirit, Ephesians says, we're to walk in love one toward another, we're to walk in truth and we're to walk in Christ. All of these are found in Ephesians, 3 John 4, Colossians chapter 2. As we walk in God's power and spend time in the Word of God and in prayer and in fellowship with one another, it becomes obvious to us then, our eyes, the scales as it were, would be taken off and we begin to see what truth really is. Uh, discerning between what is true and what is not true, what is true and what is false. For every truth there is a false. There is a heaven and there is a hell. There is the truth and there is the false. There is the negative, there is the positive. And in this world, God allowed that to take place. We're not to be people that are of this world. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus himself spoke concerning the end times. His disciples came to him and said, tell us what shall be the end? What's, what's, the, what's the time of, of your coming? What is the kingdom uh, coming look like and Jesus said these words and I want to say this to you tonight this is the thesis portion of this scripture for this entire message tonight Jesus said take heed that you be not deceived now in order to be deceived you must have already walked in truth therefore if you've been exposed to truth and you fall back to a lie it is a dangerous thing. Let me draw the analogy that Jesus gave as a, as a type for us. He said there was a man who had come to the Lord and he uh, had all kinds of problems and he gave his life to the Lord and the temple was cleansed and the demon spirit that was in him went out searching for dry places. But when the demon spirit could not find any, he came back to the same house and because he found the house, garnished but not full of the Spirit of God. He brought seven spirits with him back and inhabited that man. What you need to know is, is that in the time we're living in, you must guard your spirit against lies and deception like you never have before because it is being cloaked now in such a light and such a such a. A, a frontal approach of truth, but the backside and the agenda is full of death and poison. The Bible says in the book of Matthew 24, Jesus said that there would be, nation would rise against nation. That is ethnos against ethnos, race against race, kingdom against kingdom. That's leader against leader, leaders of nations. He said that there would be times when there would be famine, pestilence, there would be destruction of all kind, earthquakes. He said all this is the beginning of sorrows. My friends, if we're not looking at what is the beginning of sorrows right now, I don't know what we're looking at. In California, there's a hundred year drought that's going on right now. 
In Africa, the greatest famine that's ever been is happening right now. Across the Middle East and even into the Asia uh, area, they're waiting any day now for a biblical plague of locusts to launch out of the ground and begin to destroy everything in its path. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7, 13. When you see, he said, there's, there could be a time when you see drought, pestilence or disease, and locusts coming. He specifically names those three. He said, if you see all that taking place, and if you call upon me, he said, this is the way you call upon me, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, if you see all these things happening, if you see drought and pestilence and you see locusts coming, if my people, which are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in a land of such great division today that we need healing now like we have never needed before. The Bible says in Isaiah that truth has fallen in the streets. People lie to one another with such ease, and people are hearing lies to such a degree that they now don't even care what's being said anymore. People, Jesus said, one of the signs of the last days would be that many would be offended. Have you ever seen a day when people are so offended so quickly? It doesn't take very much for it to happen. He said that there would be a time when those that were supposed to be loving the Lord would become cold-hearted. They would wax worse and worse. They would fall away from being on fire for God. They would have a mindset that would be confused. In fact, in Luke 21, Jesus is speaking the words and he said, there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, perplexity. We don't know what to do. How do we figure out this Israeli-Palestinian problem? How do we figure out the China-Taiwan problem? How do we figure out America's problem, perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking upon those things which are coming upon the earth? For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of power and great glory. And when these things began to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Many would be offended, many being deceived. Someone said the other day, and I fully agree with it, that we are now living in 1939. When Adolf Hitler, out of his book, Mein Kampf, said of the Jews, if you tell a lie loud enough and long enough, the people will believe it. He's standing there with Joseph Goebbels. His propaganda, the words that I speak tonight will be very important, his propagandist, the one that kept pushing the agenda and telling the people all that was going to take place. It's going to be a wonderful day in Germany, and it became the worst of the worst. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time now where the coming socialist invasion and the storm is upon the United States of America and around the world. And I will tell you without any hesitation, and in my lifetime and in your lifetime, I've never seen anyone that has ever stepped up to say, I want to be the president of the United States and declare themselves to be a democratic socialist. I didn't know what it was. I mean, I'm sorry, but I grew up in a time period where there was only Republicans and Democrats. I didn't even know what a libertarian was. I had to look it up. What is a democratic socialist? And now it is vogue to become and call yourself a socialist. In fact, according to the latest polls, that nearly half of college students today say that they would be ready to live in a socialist society. Half. I want you to know that in many school systems and colleges and universities have turned from teaching and instruction to indoctrination in socialism. According to this particular article, the coming storm, the coming socialist storm, 
Socialism sacrifices liberty and it promises equality, but equality never comes. The only winners in a socialist system are the bureaucrats in the vast, all-powerful government that socialism requires. You need to know that the Bible reveals several, several important things and, uh, concerning uh, what people have tried to label the Bible as a socialist book. They've even tried to label Jesus as a socialist himself or pick out scriptures of their own agenda to say these are socialist ideas. But let me just give you the truth about it. Here's what the Bible says concerning the economics system of a socialist system and what the Bible says it's supposed to be. Scripture confirms and affirms that the dignity of work is important according to Ephesians 4 and 26. So what are we seeing right now? We're seeing 80 million jobs that are available and you can't find people to work. The Bible tells us that if a person doesn't work, they shouldn't eat according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse number 10. I wish they'd strike that up over the doorpost of HHS and IRS and all the rest of the government locations. The Bible clearly affirms private property in Exodus 22 verse number 7. These are all things that are happening right now to be stripped away from you and me as Americans. It condemns theft according to Exodus 20 and 15. That is when someone takes something from, let me explain because hear what I'm telling you. That's the reason why I brought these terms to you tonight that we're going to examine. You think that term means what you think it does. But I can tell you that these terms do not mean what they used to mean. Private property. The Bible condemns theft. That is taking from someone else and giving it to yourself. I don't care if that's a grade off your report card or if it's taking money out of your wallet that you earned. Come on, somebody. Covetousness is condemned by the Bible. I'm talking to you about a socialist agenda. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 22, that saving Saving finances, sacrificing and saving is important. Thrift, land ownership in, in Acts 4. Proverbs 21, thrift, the investment into your future and into future generations in Matthew 25. All of that is honored in Scripture. You should be a person who is worthy of the wages. A full day's work for a full day's pay. Socialism condemns and subverts all of these passages of Scripture 100%. But the revival of socialism is a major challenge in our age. It is the spirit of the age. And hear what I'm about to tell you. It is the forerunner of the spirit of Antichrist in our world. Christians are called to work for a just society according to Isaiah 117. Christians love justice. God is a God of justice. He's also a God of mercy. And he's not more of one than the other. This is important for you to understand. In the 1978 commencement address at Harvard University, Alexander Solzhenitsyn declared that socialism of any type and shade leads to a total destruction of the human spirit and is, a, and is to a leveling of mankind unto death. Why did he say that? Because he was a prisoner in Stalin's gulag, and he knew exactly what that meant. This is also important for you to understand that because a few days ago, President Biden made the statement concerning gun rights that no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. I want you to hear that. He said, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. Let's hear from a president in general who fought. He said, so long as we govern our nation by the letter and spirit of the Bill of Rights, we can be sure that our nation will grow in strength and wisdom and in freedom. Hallelujah. So let's consider this for a moment because the Bill of Rights, those of you that are aware of it, those of you that may not be, those first 10 amendments are the uh, individual rights of every citizen of the United States of America. So let's consider, if there is no amendment that is absolute, then what about the First Amendment of freedom of religion, freedom of speech and expression, the right to petition your government? You have watched over the past 12 months as that has come under a severe attack. 
If no amendment is absolute, consider the Fourth Amendment. And let's go ahead and call Antifa, and let's go ahead and call uh, them the brown shirts and Gestapo, like the Nazis were, who have knocked on the doors without a warrant and seizing and uh, destroying and pillaging our land to this very night. If no amendment is absolute, consider the Tenth Amendment. No amendment is absolute, so the federal government can just be the repository of all power and nothing is reserved to the states or the people. We're finding out, ladies and gentlemen, that some of the things that we've heard in the past 12 months is just now coming out to not be the way that we were told 12 months ago. How about the amendment to 13th, 14th, and 15th? If no amendment is absolute, then the freeing of the slaves is bogus. Come on, somebody. How about the 19th Amendment? How about women's rights to vote? If no amendment is absolute, all of you women can no longer vote. This statement, ladies and gentlemen, is subversion to the very Constitution of the, of the United States of which he held up his hand and put his hand on the Bible and said, I will uphold these as the truth and I will stand for the Constitution. Pastor, that's a little bit Frontal, don't you think that's a little bit harsh? Let me tell you, the pulpits of America and the people of America must stand up and speak truth to power, speak the truth in love, but do not hold back in this hour. The Bible is absolute truth. Are you hearing me? God's word matters, and God's word matters more than any other document. That's the reason why we must have understanding of times. So let me show you, and these are just a few of the things that are taking place in our world that are pointing like the forefinger of Almighty God to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Consider what's happening in the nations. Just a few days ago, as you look on the screen, one of our United States ships encountered and seized an incredible cache of weapon shipments on its way to, uh, in the Arabian Sea, on its way uh, to Yemen, sent there by the Iranians and others. I'll just go ahead and tell you right now that these, uh, you were, if you recall in 2015, when pallets of American cash was put on C-130s and flown into Iran as a payment, billions of dollars, this is what it was paying for. Uh, when you look at this picture, you may not be able to see it as close and as clear, but that entire deck of that ship is full of Russian and Iranian and Chinese-made weapons that were being sent to terrorist organizations. Thank God for our United States military tonight. And so we're trying to make friends with Iran once again. And Mr. Kerry has said, who is the instigator of that uh, horrible peace plan, the uh, Iranian peace deal that has caused Israel this very night to be fighting for its life. Let's consider what Iran has been doing, not only with the money that was sent by the United States, but also what their intentions are. Let's just see what that's all about right here. شهر چشمان بارانی را کردی آشغانت را میان دریای توفانی نم دور منطقه بود نم دور منطقه بود نم دور منطقه بود نم دور منطقه بود Please notice that. Their intent has never changed. They have one intention, and that is to drive Israel into the sea. And they want... They want blood for blood on Soleimani. 
I hope you saw in there what they had intention for for America. That is to blow up the Capitol building. Now, if my next door neighbor said, I'm coming over to burn your house down tomorrow, I'm not going out and saying I'm going to Disney tomorrow. I'm staying home to protect the property and to be able to say, you know what, if you come over here, you will find out that I will be standing guard over this because this is my property. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Ladies and gentlemen, Israel has the right to defend itself and God help America to do the same. (laughs) Consider the border crisis that's going on. It is absolute. Absolute, um, uh, uh, let me go to the next one right here, guys. There's more than 100, listen to this, more than 178,000 illegal crossings on the southern border in April alone. That's just the ones they counted. Pastor, is it right or is it wrong? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly how we're supposed to be able to deal with those that are coming from another nation. It also says this, that there should be legal things that takes place and following the law. That's what the Bible says. But when you're doing, listen, this is a wrong, it is a crime against humanity and the people coming across this border for there to be 20,000 plus children that are crammed together and yet they want to use this as political uh, uh, exercise against one party or the other And ladies and gentlemen, the taxpayers of America are paying for this. Border crossing agents are resigning every day because there is no, it is, let me put it in a word right here for you. You'll hear it again tonight, lawlessness. Probably throughout this entire study, there's been nothing that's more sobering for me than this particular article. It was not just sobering but it shook me to my shoes. I want to take just a moment to share with you what's going on in China. You know that China is all the time trying to be, uh, you know, we have leaders in America that want to be able to cozy up with China, but China is not America's friend. They've been ripping off America for years, but more than that, ripping off their own people and putting them under such forced communistic rule that absolute facial recognition software is being used to track every person in China. What are they doing now? This is called the China Social Credit System, and why is it controversial? I I need to read this just a little, so stay with me. China's Social Credit System is a set of databases and initiatives that monitor, monitor and assess the trustworthiness of individuals, companies, and government entities. A good rating could offer priority health care, deposit-free renting of public housing, while a negative rating could see individuals banned from flights and trains. I want you to hear, you're going to hear this again in a moment. It's not just in China. Negative ratings could see individuals banned from flights and trains. So how does China's social credit system work? Individuals who are deemed untrustworthy could face a number of restrictions affecting areas including loans, traveling, air, rail, as well as education. In other words, if you don't do what the government says and you get your credit rating where it needs to be, where we trust you, then you won't have access. Now, I don't know what you heard, but this is what I heard. Revelation 13, no man could buy or sell save he have the mark of the beast. Why has China set up a social credit system? Because the People's Bank of China, the nation's central bank, set this up with the 1.2 billion individuals and the 28.34 million companies and organizations way back, uh, back in 2019 and earlier. They've now begun that rating system to find out who is going to comply with the communist agenda in China and those that won't. I'm telling you, pastors are dying tonight in China. We've already seen it on the news and nothing has been done about it. It's amazing to me how we can get all up in the air 
about what's happening and blaming people here that are trying to keep law in the United States of America. But China is putting uh, Muslim individuals and those that are rejecting the, the agenda of China on trains and sending them to death camps just like the Nazis did. It's all in the news. Truth is hiding in the very front of you. The social credit system provides this, according to this article, a good moral guarantee for the reform of the development of the social, socialist economic policies, culture, and society. Now, before you say that's way over there, it's already happening in Canada. How many of you have ever seen the movie on Netflix, Black Mirror? Have you heard about it? Black Mirror is a movie that's been created on Netflix that a person has their smart device and as you approach someone else, some of you are shaking your heads, you know what I'm talking about, they give you a rating, up or down. If you get too many down ratings in this movie, you are isolated. Let's call it what the new term is and we'll say it here in a few moments cancel culture. If you get canceled out too much when you go down to the bank to get a loan for your new house, you don't get the loan. Are you hearing me? If you get canceled too much when you go down to the grocery store to buy groceries, you don't get food. This is what's coming. It is the spirit of Antichrist. What else is China doing? China is getting itself prepared to invade Taiwan. I don't have time to go into the details of the history of this, but just hear what I'm telling you. You can look this up uh, anywhere. The bottom line is, is that the Communist Party of China has long since wanted to possess that island off of their coast, basically to colonize it themselves and take it over. But it has been a, a divisionary thing between the United States and China. The United States has kept it as a, a place of democracy for a long, long time, and yet China has been doing everything it could, in fact, shooting missiles over, and all kinds of activity. If that one falls, it will be a domino effect. China has already literally built a brand new island in the middle of the China Sea and started placing armaments in that location. Hear what I'm telling you. China is going to be that eastern king that marches all the way across into Israel with a 200 million man army. And ladies and gentlemen, they already have that army in place. This is the aspirations of China. What else is going on in the world? Well, something interesting you might not have heard about. Here in the United States and around the world, especially at our United States embassies, there are sonic attacks that are taking place upon people inside the embassy and, and in different locations around the world. What is it all about? Literally, they are finding out, and the White House has just uh, made this statement recently, that they have disclosed that there is uh, sonic frequencies that somehow terrorists are using to affect literally the minds and the uh, body of individuals inside of not only the White House, but other United States embassies high frequencies, whatever, that are being shot like sonic blasts. It's literally caused one person to die, according to this article. And it's also caused people to have all kinds of tremors and PTSD and, and all kinds of physical effects of a sonic blast that terrorists are now using. They call it the Havana Syndrome. It has history there. I won't go into that tonight. But the bottom line is it's a new weapon in the arsenal of terrorists. Let's look into society for a moment. That one's got quite a bit. Here is, here is, before you roll this, here is something that, well, let me make it plain. For years, CNN has said that we are, this was their byline, we are the most trusted name in news. What you're about to see, three parts, I don't, I won't, uh, this is not the entirety of this video, but you can go on to Project Veritas' website and you can see all of them in their entirety. This is the technical director at CNN who is disclosing information that, many, that we have known that's going on, but now it's all in the open. Watch this. I think we got him through this term. We would always show shots of him jogging. Him and Xavier Shades and like, a, like you paint him as a young geriatric. We were creating a story there. We 
didn't know anything about it. You know, we were. So that's, that's I think that's probably it. I think what we did, we got Trump back. I am 100% going to say it. And I 100% believe it. And if it wasn't for CNN, I don't know that Trump would have got voted out. Our focus was to get Trump out of office, right? Without saying that, that's what it was, right? So our next thing is going to be for climate change awareness. Do you think it's going to be just like a lot of like fear? Like climate? Yeah, fear sells. Fear sells. No one ever says those things out loud, but it's obvious. And what is it? You do? Technical director, one step down from director. Roll the next one. Gangbusters are raving, raving. Gangbusters are raving, raving, right? Which is why we constantly have the death toll on the side. Let's make it higher. Like, why isn't it high enough, you know, today? Like, it would make our point better if it was higher. It's fear. Like, fear really drives numbers. Fear is the thing that keeps you too big. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. If it bleeds, it leads? Yep. Yeah. No, no one ever says those things out loud, but it's obvious. Roll number three. You're telling Michelle you were coming to me or she's saying like how media is the greatest weapon. Where were you going to go with that? Um, I mean, it's just propaganda. Like, you can really... What do you mean by propaganda? Uh, like, you can shape an entire people's perception about anything on how you do it, right? Like, just by, like, forcing a story um, um, to help, like, your platform, you know? Like, so, like, like, like Trump um, getting blasted all over, like, constant feeds of like Twitter and Fox giving you a platform is what fueled to that fire, you know? So if you hear a lie and you make it big enough, people start believing it. You have just heard firsthand right here the technical director making the statement, this is not about President Trump and it's not about President Biden. It's about what he said, propaganda. And I say this tonight very clearly. CNN has lied to the United States of America and should be out of business tonight as a news organization. Not trusted. It's the reason why you have to seek out your own news. Because ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time and I told you in 2015, when the Supreme Court made their ruling on same-sex marriage, which changed the culture by changing the words, that there would be unleashed the spirit, lying spirits upon this earth, the likes of which we've never seen before. Now, we're lying in wide open, and it makes no difference. We'll tell you a lie, and you either eat it or you don't, but we're coming. It's very interesting to me, for those of you that might look on Snoops or Snopes, S-N-O-P-E-S, you know, supposed to be the fact checker. In fact, the business says we were putting this together. Never in the history of me putting together a prophecy files have we ever had the fact checking that jumped on us as we were preparing this, pulling it down off of the web. Even to, the pro, even to the promotional slick of the prophecy files with the COVID vaccine bottle in it, they were fact-checking that before it ever even went to people. What you need to understand is there's been propaganda, just like Joseph Goebbels, just like Hitler. Pastor, I don't believe that in America. I would not want to believe it either. Believe me, I would rather go back to Andy Griffith and let's keep the doors open at night, but we're not going back. You better wake up. You better talk up. You better stand up in this hour that we're in. It's very interesting that the Snopes fact-checking leader and him in cahoots with Media Matters are also the people that bring all of the resources to CNN. So if you're checking your stuff on Snopes, they're all in the same deal. And by the way, all very good friends of Jeffrey Epstein. You might have heard of his name before. What's happening in our schools? This. Teachers are handing out across the United States. And I just want to say one of the things that God spoke to my heart about telling all of you that are parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles, 
Do not let your children bring books home and papers home and you not know what's inside of them in their entirety. Open it up, find out what's going on, read what's going on, and if you don't like it, then you speak up. Use kind words, speak the truth in love. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, this is a time when you must take responsibility for your children. They do not belong to the state, they belong to you as an individual. Because the agenda is very clear. Some school, uh, some school districts are still not open because of teachers unions. Not because of individual teachers, teachers unions. Are you hearing me? So this is going on, this is being passed out and what's it all about? Oh, we, we make it cartoons so it's funny. And the children from K to fifth grade are being indoctrinated in the gender identity unicorn so that they can select their own gender, put it all together for themselves. Let me just tell you something. The, bio, the, the, the statistics are true, and the information is true, that most children have all kinds of challenges of identity all the way to 18 years old. You need to understand that as a parent, you are to guide them in the direction that they should go. Not just let them run and do whatever they want to do. You're their parent. You're not their buddy. You're their parent. You're not their friend. Doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be the loving parent you're supposed to be, but you're to guide them so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. Why is this so important? Because of what just happened this past week. What happened? The Biden administration has now banned sexual orientation, gender identity discrimination in health care. Well, let's make it plain. In my last prophecy files, there was a transgendered individual that was up for confirmation in the Senate and in the House. And the Dr. Levine, because if I use one pronoun or the other, I could be fact-checked here tonight. So Dr. Levine, who is a transgendered individual who is now the assistant HHS director, who already said that she approved, or he approved, the giving of gender-changing medication and gender-altering surgeries to take place for children all the way down to elementary school. So now this has been put in place so that it's wide open. This is, not about, this is not about helping your children to become the young man and young woman that God meant them to be and, and created them to be. This is about an agenda that is literally from hell. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? This is important for you to get a hold of. And now we're at the place where the House has passed the Equality Act. And according to what I read just a few days ago, there's only one vote in the Senate left for it to be able to be passed. You know what this means? This means that regardless of a religious organization, regardless of what business or company that it may be, don't care anything about your values or your religious beliefs, you will be required, scored on whether or not you are complying with this law. Are you following what I'm saying? Let me make it plain. Several years ago, when this came up as a matter of law being put into place, this church voted an amendment to our Constitution that said, while we love everybody regardless of who they are, we will not allow our ministers or this facility or the hiring of any person who will be a person of LGBTQI, whatever the letters are going to continue to be. Because it does not form to what our biblical standard and fundamental faith is. This is very important for you to understand because this is going to happen in the days that are ahead. And you're going to see it. I'm trying to weave an entire message here for you tonight because you're going to see these things pop up throughout the rest of this service as I describe things for you. And the pressure is being applied and COVID has been a key ingredient to flip the entirety of the agenda of the world. Is COVID real? Absolutely. But the agenda 
to use COVID as a method to change it, to flip it to a antichrist atmosphere more than any other device is being used for that purpose right now. This would make hiring LGBT, and it's not just you can't hire or you won't hire. This will force you on the Equality Act to hire LGBT or whatever. You know what that does to churches? Shuts them down. If they stand for anything. Consider the fact that there's 120 American generals who said that the constant attack from President Biden upon the Constitution could cause the United States of America not to survive. 120 American generals. And I told you in the last Prophecy Files what was coming. That is to say that the vaccine passport is being pushed more and more. You're going to get on a plane? Show me your passport. You're going to ride the bus? Show me your passport. And who's making up these things? Who's making the rules? Those that said, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Wear two masks, don't wear a mask. Wear three masks. Wear it inside, wear it outside. Follow the science. I'm going to show you something in a minute. COVID passports are coming. And you better be prepared where you're going to stand. If you get the vaccine, that, here's the key. You are an individual that has individual rights. And you can make a decision for your own body. Isn't it amazing that those that are pushing the agenda who said that women can be able to make a decision and choice for their own body will not allow you to make a choice for your own body concerning a vaccine or anything else you want. Let me show you something very interesting. This Futuristic scenario was ran in 2015. Please listen closely. In 2015, Dr. Fauci, along with many other physicians in his, in his group and others, joined in in a futuristic scenario to facilitate medical countermeasures communication in what would be made up as a future pandemic called SPARS, not SARS, COVID, SPARS, 2015 is when this took place. They ran a whole gaming scenario, and this is the playbook. I've downloaded the entirety of the playbook. They predicted that this could happen in 2025 or 2028. Little did they know, or maybe they did, that it would happen in 2020. And the interesting thing about this, and if I had time tonight, I could run the whole thing down, but even to the hashtags and even the wording found in this document is the same wording and the same hashtags that are being used right now to speak to people across the world on how they're to conduct themselves in a pandemic just like this. If you don't think hell is pulling the strings, you should wake up. Satan is looking for his day, and I just want to let him know, it's coming. I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? I don't have time to stay there. Please notice this. Please notice. They ran the scenario of this in 2015. Interesting that China also was considering in 2015 weaponizing the coronavirus. Really? Well, how did that come out? What, what was all that about? Well, you might have heard Senator Rand Paul asking Dr. Fauci this week, what's the deal with this virus? According to the documentation that he cited this past week, Dr. Fauci contributed through, the, through his organization to the Wuhan lab through different scientists and doctors to gain of function, that is to say, to turn this into an actual human affecting virus. You can't tell whether it, come from a, whether it came from a lab or from a bat or in nature or whatever, but they have put it together 
And now he's been called on the carpet because the documentation shows that there has been grant funding that has been sent from the United States to China in the Wuhan lab that created this horrible, horrible pandemic. Please don't take my word for anything I'm saying. Go check it out for yourself because it's happening right in front of our eyes. Let's take a look quickly at the economy. In the economy, anybody remember this? Is this too far out of your memory? To know that for the first time in the history of the United States, a cyber attack took place on a major pipeline. Now, I don't know. I'm a little bit confused. Maybe you can help me out. We shut down the Keystone Pipeline, but now we're disturbed that the Colonial Pipeline that comes and feeds 45% of the East Coast oil for fuel, for cars, planes, and everything else has now been hit with a cyber attack, and we're all, except for the fact that the Energy Secretary stepped to the microphone this past week and said, well, when asked the question, what about it? Well, this is an opportunity, she says, for us to transfer from fossil fuels into the solar energy of electric cars, windmills, and solar panels. Well, if you lived in the state of Texas just a few weeks ago, you'd find out that when it gets real cold outside, those solar panels and those windmills don't work. By the way, in that SPARS game that they were playing in 2015 of a pandemic, they predicted that there would be a power outage during this pandemic. They predicted it would be in the Northwest. It actually happened in Texas. Just a thought. So the United States declares a state of emergency upon gasoline. And people in Pace and Pensacola and East Milton are online, I'm watching. You can see the fuel running out all the way down Highway 90 as people are posting and going crazy like there's a hurricane sitting out there whirling around in Florida town. People, the, the United States Energy Department had to say, please do not put gasoline in plastic bags. like they're carrying it out of Walmart. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? So the company was hacked. But let me take just a step further. This same company who the government said, we're not going to get involved with this. Wait a minute. You're involved in everything. You're telling me you're not going to get involved where there's a pipeline that's feeding 45% of the fuel of the United States of America and you are going to sit by and let that company have to take it all their own? No. What was going on? Somehow, they paid over $5 million ransom so they could get out of this situation. And they say by the end of the week, things should be starting to pick back up again, but it may be weeks because of the residual effect that's going to happen across America. Let me just say to you, what you're watching are dry runs. We're going to shut it down. We're going to shut down America. We're going to shut down churches. How do we do that? Well, we, let's use the COVID crisis as an opportunity to keep people from worshiping. And we will, we will make a law. Daniel, you can't pray or sing or chant or anything else. But Daniel said, I don't care what y'all say. I'm going to pray just like I always have, just like I've always done. You better make up your mind who you're going to serve, my friends. So they paid $5 million. Now, you know what this did. It told every terrorist organization, you're next. Let's take a look at this for energy quickly. How many of you have heard about that infrastructure bill? Infrastructure, we're going to build roads and bridges and so forth. And according to what I understand, there's only about 6% of the entirety of that bill that's dedicated towards it. The rest of it is now a refacing of the Green New Deal. You remember, you remember 
Ms. Cortez and socialist Bernie Sanders who took his honeymoon in Moscow. Who goes to Moscow on your honeymoon? Come on, Lake Tahoe, yeah, the Caribbean, Moscow? That's a true socialist. According to the Wall Street Journal, President Biden's plans tax increase to pay for the infrastructure bill will amount to be the largest increase in taxes since 1968. Guess who's going to pay for that? According to the Wall Street Journal, $621 billion of the president's proposed $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan is going to the surface of transportation infrastructure to fill up those bridges and roads and so forth. The rest of it is going as a refacing and a renaming on the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal, I don't have time to go into it, but I'll just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the Green New Deal calls for the housing authority in New York City and around the country to literally and completely be torn down and rebuilt. It amounts to more than 97 trillion dollars in debt. You can't sustain that. Let me just ask you, go out, don't do this, <laughs> go out and swipe that card over what credit limit you have and see what happens to you as an individual when you overspend. They'll leave you at the cash register looking at the lady who's handing it back to you saying, I'm sorry, sir, this card doesn't work. Here, try this one. I'm sorry, sir, this card doesn't work. And what is it leading to? It's leading to this. It's leading to what the World Economic Forum calls the Great Reset. I would encourage you to go and check this out because the world leading powers have come together for what they call the Great Reset. It's time to reface capitalism. No longer works, they said, where someone has an idea. This is amazing to me and Bill Gates and others, I, I don't understand it because Bill Gates and, and many others have created software and then the market said, we love your software, we'll buy it. That's capitalism. But because we are moving toward a one world economy and one world religion and one world government under the Antichrist, these things must take place. The Great Reset is happening even as we speak. And the governments of the world are coming together. One of the leading individuals is Prince Charles, whose father was seated in the place that would be next. Now he is becoming the next authority in that position over the country, and he has declared it's time for us to have this great reset of the economy, get everything together. Everybody makes the same thing, regardless of how you work. And they themselves have their own playbook that they have run the scenarios. And they have said, they have said, this COVID crisis is the perfect opportunity for us to change the entirety of the world's economy and make it into one world economy. Now, you remember when I was talking about the China scoring system? And now we're talking about the World Economic Forum that is saying we're going to all come together and we're going to make sure everybody is online. Every country will get involved in this. And then you've got the climate structure that's going on where everybody's going to come together and we're going to reduce emissions around the world. Please follow this. It's called the Environmental, Social, and Governance. What is it? E-S-G. Oh, you've seen it. You've seen it. It's part of what's taking place whenever there is a state, let's say Georgia, who passes an election law that says you need to be able to sign your name and us verify that name so that you can be a legitimate voter. And then suddenly, individuals who have the same mentality about the changing of society, Delta, MLB, I call them woca cola now, of all bought into 
what is now the ESG. I'm going to summarize it for you. Here's what it says. The environmental, social, and governance investing is a strategy you can use to put your money to work with companies that strive to make the world a better place. Isn't that nice? Don't you want the world to be a better place? Where's all the amens? ESG investing relies on independent ratings, scoring, that helps you assess a company's behavior. When do I care what a company's behavior is going to be? I just need some baloney from Walmart. And policies when it comes to environmental performance, social impact, and governance issues. Let me make it in plain language. If you line up with the LGBT agenda, if you line up with the climate change agenda, if you line up with the One World Economic Forum and that all comes together, we're going to give your company in the ESG a rating that will let everybody know this company is good to invest in. So if you're in the stock market or whatever that it may be, or you're shopping with a company, you're now in compliance with all of the world thought so that you too can be a citizen or what the Great Reset says and what this article says as a stakeholder. These are key words. Ladies and gentlemen, we are seeing right now the structure of that one world government that the Bible records in the book of Revelation chapter number 13. I hurry. Inflation is already here. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? I talked to one of our builders here in this, in this uh, uh, church. He told me that last year he was buying uh, uh, plywood for uh, uh, the, in, in, the, in the dollars less than uh, $40, $20 a sheet. Now it's 280% higher, 80 plus dollars a sheet just to buy it. So inflation is already here. Everything is rising. You're seeing it everything. And what is that doing? In the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of war, in the middle of climate change, fuel, food, and fear, just like CNN said, is being sold. And listen, Christian people are finding themselves in a place of fear because they don't know that God is able to provide all of their needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I quickly go to this under religion. This is coming to the church. It's in Canada. It's coming to America. Watch this. In the middle of the road, they waited with AHS. And here they are behind. So we'll see, we'll see what is about to happen. Freedom in Canada, democracy in Canada, full force. Unbelievable. Hello, sir. Let's start here. So, as per the injunction that was served on uh, Arthur here and uh, David back here, I am to place both of them under arrest for breach of the Queen's Bench order. Both of us under arrest. Yes, sir. Would you please step out of the car? Open the door, man. Whoa, stop.
guys. This is not communist China. Do you guys have family and kids? This pastor was arrested. He knows all too well, having grown up in Poland, now pastoring in Canada. And when they came into his church to stop his service, he told them to leave. He had every right to do that, except the government has now said, you have no right to gather, and they arrested the man. I'm praying for this wonderful Canadian pastor, and I pray that he continues to stay bold like a lion, and God keeps his hand upon him. Amen? The National Day of Prayer has just passed recently, and now we have seen where Franklin Graham brings to our attention the fact that President Biden, for the first time in the history of presidents, omitted God in his remarks towards the United States of America. He said, I'm deeply saddened to read that the President Biden is the first president to omit the word God in his proclamation. And he said that this sets a very dangerous precedent. It basically says, we don't want or need God in the United States of America. It goes deeper than that. Because when they ask for a permit, like they have for years and years, for 70 years as a matter of fact, to hold the National Day of Prayer in front of what was a compound with Bob wire around the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., which by the way, that building belongs to the, to the American citizens as the people's house. Come on, somebody. When they submitted for a permit to be held there, they said there'll be no permit given for you to hold this in front of the Capitol. Now, whenever we brought this article up and we started making this part of this presentation, we were fact-checked and said that it wasn't President Biden that denied it. So, technically, it wasn't the government of the president. It was the Capitol Police who said, you'll not hold it here. Well, who does the Capitol Police work for? The President of the United States, okay? Let's go a little further here quickly because the Pope now has said that it's important for us. Look at this one world government going on. He calls for the civil union laws for same-sex couples. He also said this past week, and Nancy Pelosi applauded it by saying that communion can be given to Catholics like Nancy Pelosi and President Biden, even though they hold to a belief that abortion is okay, we'll still give them communion. Now, to the Catholic individual, communion is salvation. And I want you to understand that proposal and that information coming from the Pope is certainly eye-opening. And the White House, uh, according to Pope Francis, it's now an obligation, a moral obligation for you to be vaccinated. It's up to you. I'm thankful that we have people that are resourcing and helping me to be able to understand more and more and what you're looking at right here. You remember just a moment ago when I spoke to you about the China social credit system? Do you remember how they scored the business? Do you remember the ESG that I just spoke about, how they would score companies based upon their governance and their social uh, um, uh, agenda with LGBT and everything else? Well, guess what? This is Church Clarity. Church Clarity's website is one that you can submit the name of a church and they will look at it and they will score that church based upon their agenda of social, uh, social agendas of LGBT, so forth and so on. They'll score it for you. There are Assembly of God churches, many of our main Assembly of God churches that are already on this website that have been scored. And if you don't draw the right kind of score with the right kind of mentality about it, inclusion and so forth, then you won't be on the list to receive. Let me take it a little step further. This is where it's going. Currently, a larger percentage of this church uses the app and your ability to take your debit card or credit card and put it on there and you can do reoccurring giving or most of the time your contributions are being made that way. And we're thankful for that, especially during last year. But according to this and according to the other things that I've already talked to you about, here's the bottom line. When MasterCard, who is, and others who have become woke, okay, 
In other words, and I'll explain woke to you in a few moments, but when these companies say that we're of this particular agenda and we, and we adhere to this particular agenda, but yet we found your score on church clarity as not lining up with ours, we will no longer do business with you with MasterCard, Visa, or any other company. And suddenly the means of funding for the church is stripped away simply because you will not comply. And I wonder how many believers at that moment who truly trust in the Word of God and tithe will continue to do so. You know the wonderful thing about this church? It is completely paid for. We owe no man anything. Nothing. One thing in nature for you. Just this past week, the earliest tropical storm recorded in the history of record keeping. And I find it interesting that the name of that storm is Andreas. You ever heard of the San Andreas Fault? That is not such a great thing. They've just considered that we're going to back up hurricane season earlier than what it has been before. So now locusts are coming and a hundred year drought is coming. And all these things are taking place. But here is the linchpin. And that is Israel. I move quickly to tell you that Israel is obviously, if you've seen this, has been pounded and pounded with more than 3,000 rockets in just seven days. They have been, and just as I'm speaking up here right now, there have been rockets that have been launched into Israel. And it makes no difference if it was on their holy day, Shabbat, or whether it was just another day of the week. It makes no difference. The terrorists are sending in their bombs because, in my opinion, they have seen that America has backed away in its policies from Israel. And they see an open door. Hear what I'm telling you. God gives the incredible intelligence to his chosen people. And when they needed something to stop these Kassam and, and Scud missiles flying in, this is what came to pass. It's called the Iron Dome. You're looking at footage that's been taken just this past week. To God be the glory. God gave them the wisdom to put together an instrument of such great power that they could blow the rockets right out of the sky and preserve their people for the glory of God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is lining up right now for what you see to be the Gog and the Magog War, the nations of the world that are gathering around tiny Israel to push her into the sea. But Israel and God's people will be preserved. And I say for Pace Assembly, for myself, and I trust for this entire congregation, we will stand with Israel regardless because they have been and always will be God's chosen people. Come on, give God glory for it tonight. I move quickly. The terrorist organization Hamas, which is in the Hebrew, the word violence. Violence filled the land during Noah's day. Hamas. Hamas's one 1988 charter that literally Mahmoud Abbas, who is in charge of the PLO right now, was one of the contributors to the charter of Hamas. And this is a thesis statement for this entire document. Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it. They will never, never, until the Antichrist comes and signs a seven-year peace plan. Just, just curious, how many of you are not going to be here to see that event take place? I, the wisdom of the IDF is amazing. They made an announcement, and with the contributing factors of the national and international media, they declared just a few days ago 
the IDF is now crossing the border of Gaza with an intrusion to take out house to house the terrorists, only to find out they weren't going across because the IDF already knew that the moment that announcement made, the terrorists would hide in the tunnels that they've made and wait for those soldiers to come across and take them out. So they did exactly what they thought they were gonna do. When they made that announcement, the terrorists went inside of the tunnels and the IDF sent their missiles and made those tunnels a graveyard for hundreds of terrorist individuals. God's hand is moving. Israel has no choice but to defend itself, ladies and gentlemen. Israel has no choice. It's important for you to understand that America has been shaking hands with Iran for quite some time. And all the while that President Trump was in office, Mr. Kerry, former Secretary of State, was informing that gentleman right there in Iran of all the activity that was going on undermining the policies of the United States of America. I move to the conclusion phase of this message here tonight to tell you that he that controls the world's words controls culture. Let me say that again. The people that control the words control the culture. Why is that so important? Because it does matter what you say. And it does matter what words mean. We say words, it's just semantics, but, but semantics means words. And when you're talking about words, you've got to have a clear understanding. Otherwise, you won't be able to approach it on the same level. In other words, a child opens up with its life with the first words learning, mama and daddy. Amen. Why are those words important? Because they don't say them or they. They say mama and daddy because those words are important to distinguish between male and female. It's important for you to understand that the government is spending time, energy, and money to invest in changing the words to change the culture. So, wanting to keep more of your hard-earned money now becomes greed. Taking more of someone else's money is called paying your fair share. Here's one that you hear a lot of these days, my truth, my truth. Truth is reality regardless of any individual feelings or perception, but my truth is how I perceive things regardless of how they really are. How about same-sex marriage? Without getting into the politics of it, Throughout history in every culture, marriage has been a union between one man and one woman. Same-sex marriage, when that term was changed, it changed everything. Now it is defined as a union of men with men and women with women. But it is most certainly not the union of husbands and wives. So what does that mean? That means that we literally have changed the culture now where you've got to explain to your children what is a godly marriage and what is an ungodly marriage. So as I take up the final portion of Prophecy Files tonight, I want you to understand that I'm going to take on some terms that I have handed out for you so that you can understand and know what the definitions are. I have one agenda to bring the truth to you and that is not only the truth of what they are saying and what is being said, because the words that we think I grew up in a time where, where if you described racism, it was defined basically as somebody, somebody that had a prejudice against someone else, regardless of what their, uh, what, who they were, what they were, but it was based basically upon skin color and so forth. That definition has been changed to mean a whole lot of other things. And tonight, I'm going to take on what is now the most controversial subject and subject terms in the United States of America that are facing churches, school boards, and the like. It's called critical theory. You see it defined uh, and explained and expanded as critical race theory and a host of other different uh, 
terms. I would say to you this evening, I am, I don't often share books with everybody because some people may have different opinions and ideas, but let me just say to you, I would suggest if you want more intelligence on the study of what I'm talking to you about tonight, I believe that this gentleman has his finger. He's a minister. He is uh, of, of different belief than Pentecost as far as that goes, but that has nothing to do with the intelligence and the information that is in this book. It's called Fault Lines, Vodi T. Bauckham. Most of the material I give to you tonight will come from this book and from his instruction. It's important for you to have an understanding of what's going on so that you can not get into a fight over race, but you can be able to stand in a biblical position and continue to love people regardless of their skin color, background, social status, or what's going on in their life. And I'm telling you this is a volatile subject, volatile subject. I said to you just a few weeks ago that the attack is coming as a bullseye on the church to divide the church with race. And I want to make it very, very clear for you here tonight that Pace Assembly has been in all of its history and continues to this day to serve everybody, love everybody, regardless of who they are and where they come from. That will continue ad infinitum. But the subject of critical race theory is one that is so volatile today that it is on the forefront, and I must take this subject. Because if you don't have understanding of the terms, then you can be deceived like Jesus said. In fact, it's so volatile. Listen to this lady who stood up in front of the Loudoun County School Board to declare her absolute disdain for students being taught critical race theory. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now I have a dream that we will implement love, not hate, or supporting another Jim Crow's agenda. CRT is not an honest dialogue. It is a tactic that was used by Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan on slavery very many years ago to dumb down my ancestors so we could not think for ourselves. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. Let me educate you. An honest dialogue does not impress, oppress. An honest dialogue does not implement hatred or injustice. It's to communicate with deceiving, without deceiving people. Today, we don't need your agreement. We want action in a backbone for what we ask for today, to ban CRT. We don't want your political advertisement to divide our children or belittle them. Think twice before you indoctrinate such racist theories. You cannot tell me what is or is not racist. Look at me. I had to come down here today to tell you to your face that we are coming together and we are strong. This will not be the last. Greet and meet respectfully. God bless this woman. In the most liberal county in the United States and the richest county, Loudoun County, Virginia, she stood up in front of that school board to declare that she hates this indoctrination of her children and should not be taught. I want to go on record here tonight to let you know that we have a wonderful school board member that comes to this church, Brother Charlie Elliott. Just a few days ago, he made his stand against critical race theory. And as a result of that, with the Santa Rosa County School, I spoke to Dr. Barber on Friday, the superintendent of schools here in Santa Rosa County, and she made her statement in an emergency meeting a few days ago and has assured me from her mouth that there will not be in Santa Rosa County any critical race theory taught to the students of this county. God bless Dr. Barber and all the school board. In fact, I told her and she asked, she said, Pastor, please ask your church to pray for us. We are standing on the front lines of all that's going on and we understand what our role is. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to keep your hand upon Superintendent Barber. I ask you to keep your hand upon every school board member and let your spirit overshadow them and let them be strong in the values and principles that are held true in this particular county with biblical values and interest for every student and for the teaching and instruction of every student, we give you praise for keeping your hand upon her and the school board and the teachers and the schools of Santa Rosa County in Jesus' name. Somebody that's gonna keep on praying for them, give the Lord praise right now. Would you do it?
I will not go into the depth of every one of them. That's the reason why I've written them down for you. But by definition, critical race theory is divisive all of its own. According to Wikipedia, it's an academic movement of civil rights scholars and activists in the United States who seek critical, critically examine the laws that interest the issues of race to challenge mainstream liberal approaches to race, racial justice. Well, that's a nice way to say what they truly mean. It holds that the most important thing about you is your race, the color of your skin. That's who you are, not your behavior, your values, or environment, your race. That is totally not biblical. It is ungodly at its core. I, have no, I, I don't have a lot of time to be able to share with you the details of all of it. Again, that's the reason why I've written it down and put it in a form so that you can keep it for yourself. I want you to imagine this in a picture so that I can describe this to you accurately. Critical theory, along with social justice, as you've heard those terms in society, and this entire strand of terms that are written on that page and many, many others can be imagined like a train. So let me put it like this. Critical theory or critical race theory and social justice along with Marxism and socialism is the engine of the train. The other subsequent things that are on the page that you see there is basically the boxcars to the train. Many Christians think that and if you're a Christian, listen very carefully to me. If you're a Christian, here's the fact. Many Christians today, pastors, churches, and denominations are getting sucked into a racial divide to denounce whiteness in order to be an anti-racist. Not just not a racist. I'm not a racist. Well, you're still a racist because you're white or whatever. Hear what I'm telling you. Many are being sucked into this vortex, and the terms don't mean what you think it does. Real Christians love people regardless of their skin color, regardless of their background, regardless of who and where they come from. Racism is sin, let me make it clear. And Christians will, real Christians will go to battle when someone says race is present, racism is present. Critical theory, critical race theory, social justice movement is like this train that is the engine. And the boxcars include racial justice and LGBT and climate justice and queer justice and liberation theology and socialism and Marxism and intersectionality and on and on it goes. And many Christians think that they can get on the racial boxcar and say, well, I'm just going to stand against racism and leave the rest of it alone, but that is not the agenda of what's going on today. You take it all when you get on this train. Critical race theory in its first tenet says that everything is racist. That's the reason why you'll never hear a conversation about reforming those in police or other organizations that are racist, only defund them. Hear what I'm telling you. In the middle of the night when somebody is breaking in your window, and you've defunded the police to such a degree like they have in New York City, and there's nobody to call. You are left alone. My friends, this is not the agenda of a law-abiding society. That is lawlessness. For some, Christianity. For some in this, in this group of critical race theory, Christianity is racist because it is seen as the oppressor on the oppressed. And who is it that's purporting this? There's one individual. His name is Ibram X. Kendi. His book is the National Book Award winner, New York Times bestseller. It is the encyclopedia of critical race theory. What's he all about? Every Fortune 500 book, uh, every Fortune 500 company, major companies, others, Delta, so forth and so on, are doing everything they can to get him to come and beat them around the head and shoulders about how bad they are as a racial, in, uh, they've got racism all around them. And for a man who says that he wants to have equal justice, this man is paid twenty to $40,000 an hour to tell you what a horrible person you are. 
Ladies and gentlemen, critical race theory and the like is not just an idea or an ideology, it is a religion. It has its own leaders, it has its own priests. And you need to understand that he's literally proposed a amendment to the Constitution that would form a brand new department of anti-racism that would watch over all the way to the local level of every person who is caught in the act of some racial or racist activity. The terms, understanding the terms of socialism. I don't have time to go into the depths of it, but socialism has killed many a people and many governments. Our niece is from Venezuela. They live in South Florida. Her father and mother are doctors in Venezuela and they're bartering for toilet paper because the richest nation that owned Sitco gas companies for a long time went from the height of richness to the depths of socialism. And we in America are on the same path as Venezuela. This driving engine also has Marxism at its forefront. Now, the reason why you need to take time to explain this to your children and gather your kids around you, and I don't care how old they are, and begin to talk to them about who Karl Marx is, if you don't, they're going to fall for all of his ideologies in the society that's coming right now. Marxism we are told on your paper is about sharing what we have from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That's Marxist theology in a nutshell. So what is that? Well, it transfers into organizations, as I told you several months ago at a Prophecy Files update, that Black Lives Matter and Antifa both have what they have self-ascribed as trained Marxists as leaders in those organizations. Trained Marxists. The trained Marxist leader in the BLM movement has just bought more than $3 million worth of homes. And ladies and gentlemen, this goes against everything that they say they're preaching. What is the other? Social justice terminology. It is the redistribution of resources from those who unjustly obtained it to those who justly deserve it. What is social justice? Social justice means getting what you don't deserve because you're favored. Justice, and anytime you put a term in front of justice, you distort its meaning. God is a God of justice. The book of Micah tells us that we are to love justice as Christians. Are you still here tonight? We're to love justice, and God will be a just God at a day of judgment that is coming. But hear me, social justice and many churches are falling into this trap tonight to say we're going to do all these wonderful things, but it's never enough. Hear what I'm telling you. Justice asked who did it social justice asked why did they do it let me run something down for you exodus says do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd and do not favor favor don't show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit i'm talking bible here y'all all right Leviticus says, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the greatest, but judge your neighbor justly. Moses, the greatest lawgiver in history, declared in Deuteronomy, follow justice and justice alone. Romans says, God shows no partiality. The Bible is preoccupied with the protection of the widow, the orphan, and the unfortunate. But compassion follows justice. It does not precede it. Hear what I'm telling you. God wants us to be able to look to him and not show partiality. But what this all is is definite partiality. Look at this next term quickly. Intersectionality. There's a name for you. I'm going to put it in a nutshell for you because it's a little bit difficult even to understand, it's a, it's a quagmire of terms. Here's what it says. It says, you will receive more 
if you have basically multiple intersections coming into your life, if you're a, if you're a black man, you're already oppressed. This is what it says. So you have one intersection. But if you're a black woman, you're more oppressed. That's another intersection. If you're a black woman who is gay, that's another intersection. So your score mounts up so that you receive more do not based upon whether or not you're working or whatever it is, but based solely upon the color of your skin or your intersectionality. That defeats everything that freedom is all about. Intersectionality. The Bible says that nations would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and you're watching it happen right now. Here's another thing that's happening, and this one is coming quickly, and we've already seen the forerunner of it. It's universal basic income. It's essentially a program where the government is providing basic levels of income to each and every citizen. This past week, the president said, we're going to start handing out checks for people because daycares need to be able to be open. Thousands of daycares have closed because of COVID, and now we're going to hand out checks. And what is that formation going to look like? It's not going to be to Pace Christian Academy across the street. It's going to go to government daycares that fall in line with the agenda that says if you, if you fall in line with this, you get government funding. Universal basic income was something that one of the presidential candidates put out on his platform and said that everybody can get a $1,000 check every week. Do you know what's collapsing America right now? It's because more people have been receiving stimulus checks and unemployment, and now you can't find people to be able to go to work in the time that we're in. Right? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this is marching us faster toward that antichrist spirit than anything else could take place. The first thing that God gave man was work. And if you don't work, the Bible says you don't eat. So it's time. And I'm thankful to the governor of Florida, the governor of South Carolina, the governor of Alabama who said that stimulus check is over. As of June the 12th, you better be looking for a job. I like this term. It played right into the Word of God for me. Woke. It means that there's now you've come into an awareness. This is what Delta has done. We've come into awareness that we are all uh, horrible oppressors of other people. Ladies and gentlemen, if that's true, why did 500,000 men die in the Civil War? Why did America stand up and rebuild Europe after World War II? Because America at its founding was a country that loved freedom and was built upon Judeo-Christian principles to love and to help people. Don't you fall into this trap because here's what I say about that. The Bible says in Romans 13 and 11, and that knowing the time that now it's high time to awake. God didn't call you to be awoke. He said, be awake. Look at your neighbor right now because some of y'all are falling asleep and say, you better get awake. He's coming out here. Systemic racism. Have you heard this statement before? Systemic racism. What does it mean? It means that America has always been a racist country and will always be a racist country. And so what did President Trump open up the 1776 project, which would return the curriculum to the school to train students and children in America's founding from 1776. But the critical race theory group of people want us to take America's founding to 1619 and say that's when America was founded, when the first slaves came on this shore. Racism is wrong. Slavery is wrong. God's word said you're to have dominion over the fish, the fowl of the air, and the herbs of the ground, and no man is to own another man. That's the Bible. Now let me make it personal quickly. I grew up in a neighborhood in Fort Walton Beach, Florida on Comet Street with white, black, and Asian people all around me, next door, across the street, everywhere. We played together, we respected one another, 
Everybody worked hard and gained their own housing and, and all that was going on and took care of one another. And just up the hill from what was called the low rental section, government housing, I had many friends all around there. Some on my street were racist. And you know what? They voiced it. And now they're dead. And justice is going to come to them for their racist spirit. I don't have to worry about getting vengeance. God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. But hear me, we believe in justice, but I reject the idea that America is systemically racist. And I reject the fact, uh, the idea that we cannot be reconciled both to God and both to one another, regardless of your race, your social status, or who you are. If you love the Lord and serve the Lord and I love the Lord and serve the Lord, then somewhere we can get together and I'm gonna tell you where that's at in just a moment. There was no white privilege on my street. My next door neighbors, we played in the, in the playground that was their part of their home. African American family, and I got news for you. They called her Mud Ear. The children called her Mud Ear. I heard Mud Ear one time. I looked out the window of my house, and she said, I ain't letting you be a rebellious kid. And I saw him coming around the corner one time. She grabbed that cable cord that had a whole lot of it strung out on the ground, and she took care of business. You know why? Because together we were a family on my street and loved one another. My daddy disciplined me, and if I got out of line, my parents offered up my behind to everybody on the street. It wasn't a white privilege. Everybody loved each other. No one felt left out. That's America. And don't you let people lie to you. That's America. And if you've got prejudice in your heart, you better repent, get right before God, and God will forgive you, and you can love people like you ought to love. And that goes for black against white or white against black or against red or yellow, whatever that it is. Is there a racism in America, absolutely, because there's evil in America, and evil all the way around. It's sinful because it's in the heart, but it's not in every heart. Where does that idea come from? It comes from the new definitions of racism and how to be an anti-racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Quickly, you're going to hear about equity and equality. Equity, the definition is there for you. Equity deals with outcomes. Equality deals with equal justice under the law, regardless of your background, race, or social status. Cancel culture is another terminology. I've given you the definition. What does it mean? It means withdrawing your support just because somebody has a differing opinion. Hey, can we respect one another's opinion? Come on, somebody. I like pizza. Anybody like pizza? Amen. How many of you don't like pizza? <laughs> when is it that we cannot tolerate someone else with their opinion? Cancel culture. The devil is a liar. And now here's the way it all transfers, and I'm coming to a close. First, it was global warming. Everything's going to burn up. And Al Gore said, oh, everything's going to melt down. John Kerry said, it's global warming. So he got on his private jet, flew all the way around to get an award for his global warming speech and created more emissions than he would. <laughs> now it was changed to climate change because that term sounds better. Now it's called climate justice. What does that have to do? It has to do with redistribution of wealth on a global scale. It's socialism, ladies and gentlemen. And here's what you need to know as I come to a close. Critical social justice will not tolerate in the future the gospel of Jesus Christ in the marketplace. You better get ready. Go ahead. Go ahead and start saying Jesus in the open and see if you don't get canceled by somebody who don't like it. And I'm not just talking about 
in society. I'm talking about in church. Christianity is going to be canceled in the days that are ahead by people who don't like it and see it as an oppressor because social justice sees the gospel as the source and means of oppression. But God's word, listen, if that's true, then the parable of the talents is not equality or equity. Some got 30, some got 60. You know what that means? That means that God's word and God himself, here's the reason, nothing is equal or equitable in nature. The God of heaven created nature, but nothing is equal. Do we want everybody to be the same height, the same color, the same hair, the same? That's what Nazi Germany under Hitler was trying to form up was a super race of people. God is not equitable, but he is no respecter of person. Are you hearing me? So what does that mean, Pastor? That means if this society continues on its track, it will cancel God and he will not be acceptable in the marketplace because he's not equal with everybody. And enter the Antichrist. Matthew 24 tells us very clearly what's happening in our society. Revelation 13 tells us that that system of the Antichrist is even upon us right now. And pastors are confused and denominations are confused. The Methodists have split and made a transgendered individual the head of their fellowship. The Lutherans have said that the bishop of the Lutheran church is now a transgendered individual. And I'm telling you that there is even controversies in the assemblies of God over the very things that I'm talking to you about tonight. The Bible tells us very clearly that we are fighting a fight with spirits according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This fight is not with flesh and blood. Come on, get away from that. Our fight is with principalities and powers in high places, rulers of darkness. And the Bible says that we're fighting against those spirits that are trying to tear down the Word of God. But he said, you've got to pull down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of God's Word. And in doing so, ladies and gentlemen, you'll walk according to the love, care, and compassion of God and His Holy Word. I'm telling you tonight, my dear friends, that there is but one place and one answer for the problems of this society that includes social justice and reconciliation, social justice and critical race theory and all that's going on. There is no answer from humans. The answer happened on a hill outside of Jerusalem, when lifted up on that hill was a man called Jesus. He was a Jew, and the Samaritans hated the Jews, and the Romans hated Jesus. And so they crucified him simply because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Are you hearing me? It's very important for you to understand that we are on the threshold of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the next great event on the calendar of God is the rapture of the church. And I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is no amount of your opinion or thoughts that should keep you away from the next great event called the rapture for those that are born again believers in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that reason, there is only one place that you can go to be reconciled back to God. Please note that the cross has a center beam that goes straight up, but there's also the arms that reach out to one another. And the example of Jesus Christ on that cross and his sacrifice for all of us says, 
Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one of us in here that deserve anything. And we didn't earn anything because of our background, because of our raising in church, because of our race, because of anything else. We came to Jesus because our soul was sin sick and there was only one place to go and that's to the man Jesus on the cross. The only question is, are you going to be ready when he comes? And I want to say to you tonight, my friends, it's time for us to be reconciled to God wholeheartedly and not allow all that I have just spoken to you to get inside of our hearts to divide the church And suddenly we've got a section of Asians, a section of black, a section of white, and a section of miscellaneous. We are one in the body of Christ. And that makes me one with you and you with me. I brought this cross into this service tonight to conclude because the man who built it is in this room. But it's more than just a cross that's been built. Many years ago, I feel a revival about to happen. Many years ago, while The congregation was not in this building, but in the chapel that was called the sanctuary at the time. A phone call came in the middle of the night. Came to the parsonage. Brother Lowry got up, called for Brother Zepp to join him. Somebody was at the hospital in Sacred Heart, and they needed to come. That call was made to get them on the road in the middle of the night because This church had been busing in children from the projects, black, white, Hispanic, and the like, thousands, feeding, teaching, loving, caring. And the KKK didn't like it. And so they put a hit out on Reverend Lowry. And their plan was to get him to drive down scenic highway and they would push him off of the cliff. That night, Brother Lowry and Brother Zepp drove to Sacred Heart Hospital only to find out that the person they were coming to see was not there. They got in their car and started making their way back to Pace and Brother Lowry said, let's take the turn. You better listen to the Holy Ghost when he speaks. He said, let's take the turn and go by West Florida Hospital and see if they happen to be there. Taking the turn off of Scenic Highway caused them to go a different direction. And because of that, they came back home unscathed and not even knowing what had been planned for their destruction. One of the men who was a part of that group of KKK people who said, we're going to take them out because of this, because they love another race. Who was the enforcer for the state of Florida in the Ku Klux Klan? Said, I'll not have a part of it. You're not going to touch this man of God. I'm out. And as I understand it, within days, took his... KKK uniform and walked into that chapel with it in his hand and under the anointed preaching of our great emeritus pastor, Brother Lowry, walked down the altar and laid that cloak on the altar and gave his life to Jesus Christ 37 years ago. You want the answer to racism? America, 
Stop stoking the fires of a false narrative and the fake news and start listening to the voice of God and there will be reconciliation and there will be a revival in America if you'll stand for truth. <laughs> 37 years ago, it's been 37 years since this man has come back to Pace Assembly, he lives in another, in another county. But he surrendered his life that night. And from that time, he's lived for Jesus Christ and renounced his racist ideology. And tonight, this cross stands here because this man built this cross. He said, I no longer burn the cross, I build crosses. I'm glad to invite to this platform tonight a friend of this ministry and a man who gave his life 37 years ago to Jesus Christ and said no more of that for me. Would you let this man who's had a transformation in his life 37 years ago know from this church that one God sets free is free indeed. I want you to know not only does God love you, but you told me back there in that green room that if it hadn't been for the Lord who had saved your life, you'd be a dead man tonight. Amen. Long, ago. Long ago. Long ago. But he built a cross. A few weeks ago, I was preaching and I said, I hope I don't offend anybody. And I started making statements concerning racism in America and how it set its bullseye upon the church to divide and conquer. After that Wednesday night service, Brother LeGerald came to me. <laughs> He said, Pastor, you stop apologizing. I know your heart, and I know this church, and we're standing with you. Tonight, if America wants to see revival, let him come to the cross, and let him come to the cross, and watch what God can do when two men come together and say we will serve the Lord. Oh my God, get on your feet and celebrate what God has done and will do for the glory of God. Come on and celebrate and lift your hands and thank God. Come on, let your voice be heard in here. You're watching what America needs for revival. You're seeing right now what it's gonna take. Not more hate speech, not more hate and, and anger towards one another, but two individuals who will meet at the cross of Jesus and be part of the body of Christ. We need revival in America. How many of you would agree that the message of the cross is what it's going to take to see it happen? I ask these two men if they would be strong and bold to come tonight to make their stand publicly so that others and our children, come on somebody, and our children and our children's children can see what real love is all about. Pray, Brother Lowry. To God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your divine provision. No matter where we are, or what we've come through, or what we're going through, our God is able to make us one in Him, Christ Jesus. 
We're so thankful for the blood of the Lamb that can change every heart and every mind and every soul. If men will surrender to God and women will surrender to God, he can make all things new. He can turn things around. He can set your feet on the right foundation and he can put a love in your heart that this world did not give you and the world cannot take it away from you. We thank you for the love of Calvary. We thank you for the love of Calvary. We're all recipients of that love. And we thank you that it goes to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that will come to Jesus and open their heart. Oh, hallelujah. Give God. Lift your hands and bless the Lord this very night. God is going to send a revival to Pace Assembly because of what just happened in this auditorium. If you believe it, somebody give him shouts of praise tonight. Get on your feet and give God the glory that is rightfully deserving him.